Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we have the uh, the hymn of meditation, I would like to introduce our speaker for the hour. The person that God has given us to share the word with us is Pastor Dr. Janice DeWhite Safo. She is a pastor and biblical scholar and currently associate professor at Loma Linda University School of Religion. I, I know that uh, she doesn't like long introductions, so I'll keep it short. All I will say that if you have ever heard her share the word of God, you know that she is a person who speaks the anointed word of God. And we are delighted to have Pastor Janice with us today. I know that the Lord has a blessing in store for all of us. And I know that God has given her something special to share with his people. And so I want us to pray with and for her as she brings us the words of life. We're going to have the, uh, the hymn of meditation. And after the hymn of the meditation, the voice that we are going to hear is none other than that of God's speaker to us at this divine hour. Pastor Dr. Janice DeWhite, Safo. Waiting for the young ladies. That with church. Um, today we're going to be singing hymn 532 day by day. Amen. 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 Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find. To me, my trials here, trusting in my father's wise bestowment. I've no cause for worry or for fear. He's whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best, loving me part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me, with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his child and treasure, is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure, this the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose the space consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting to take as from my father's hand one by one the days the moments fleeting till I reach the promised land Amen, Amen. 
Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I want to Happy thank day. our young ladies for that lovely hymn. And I also want to thank Dr. Okra for the introduction and also the leadership generally um, for this invitation to the retreat and today uh, for the opportunity to share the word of God. And um, I must say that I'm really excited about the word that God has for us today. Um, and so I pray that wherever you are, you're going to get comfortable and um, you're going to enjoy, continue enjoying being in the presence of God today. Um, as I'm welcoming everyone, I want to take this opportunity to give a special welcome um, to my family. Um, first, my husband and my daughter. And I'm wondering if uh, media can help me. Um, he, he can't come on video right now, but we have our family picture up on his display. So if you can spotlight, okay, okay, there he is. Um, thank you, my love. This is um, a manifestation uh, for all of you um, joining us that every time I preach, it is with the partnership or because of the partnership and support that I have. Um, and so I'm really grateful. We have a toddler daughter. And so if it wasn't for my husband who is taking care of her, this would be actually a very uh, difficult exercise. And so we are thankful to God for giving us the opportunity um, that we have to minister and to serve him. And um, we do switch and swap as well as he also um, teaches and preaches um, across uh, various churches. Um, and I want to also say that today we also have our two moms who are joining us um, and I want to give them a special welcome as well. We're grateful for their love, for their support um, and uh, really, really grateful to have them. Um, joining us today. Our family members, our friends who are joining us um, from here, from the UK, from Ghana, we want to welcome you as well. Uh, as I'm saying all of this though, I'm really excited for one person who I know is joining each and every single one of us wherever we are, um, in our homes, in our lives, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And Amen. so if you are glad about that, I want to invite you to pray with me as well today. Dear Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to bask in your presence, to be embraced by you, to learn from you, to receive wisdom that we need to live our lives. And as I think about the many people who are on this meeting this morning and this afternoon, I recognize that each of us are coming with our different lives, our different stories, our different challenges. And it may even be that some of us, today is not a good day. Today is the day that we are getting ready to throw in the towel, to give up, to do something because we're tired, because we've tried over and over again, because maybe we've been praying and we're not feeling like you are listening to us. Today, I'm asking that you would just exceed our expectations. You would do what only you can do, and that is you'll break your word like bread for every person that needs it to meet their own needs, their own life situations, something that no human being can do, but only your Holy Spirit. As we experience you and your word, we ask that it would be life and life more abundantly. And we not only say your kingdom come, but we open our hearts and our lives and recognize 
that your kingdom is indeed already here among us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God's kingdom Amen. now. God's kingdom Amen. now. Thank you for the person who read our scripture reading. Um, I want to emphasize it or read it for emphasis once again. Luke 17, verse 20 to 21. The Pharisees asked Jesus when God's kingdom was coming. He, that's Jesus, replied, God's kingdom isn't coming with signs that are easily noticed. Nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. Don't you see? God's kingdom is already among you. God's kingdom is already among you. Jesus's passion and his purpose was to spread the good news about the kingdom of God. And sometimes uh, the term kingdom of heaven is also used interchangeably. What's interesting is that Jesus's forerunner, his cousin, uh, the one who prepared the way for him, as it were, had a message that was very similar as well. John the Baptist um, according to Matthew's gospel, chapter three, verses one and two, preached this kind of sermon. And this is the sermon that every preacher uh, should aspire to, that one day we're going to get up in the midst of the congregation and we too are going to preach a two sentence sermon. And this is John the Baptist sermon. He said, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. And the, the gospel of Matthew chapter four, verse 17 also records for us that from that time, Jesus began to announce, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. As he traveled, verse 23 of chapter four tells us, throughout Galilee, Jesus taught in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. And so in Jesus's mind, in Jesus's ministry, the good news went along with the manifestation or the embodiment of that good news. The kingdom of God for Jesus was central. It was central. And one thing that we can keep in mind is that when we talk about the kingdom of God, we are not simply referring to a realm. That is a geographical space like heaven. Um, but we are also referring to the reign of God or the rule of God. So not only a realm, a place, but also the reign, the rule of God, the presence of God in our lives. And additionally, not only that the kingdom of God is both the realm and the reign of God, but that the kingdom of God is not just a future reality. It is not just something to come. It is not the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is not only something that the saints ascend to at the end of time. But Jesus Christ recognized, he preached, he emphasized to people that although it is a future reality, it is also a present reality. Amen. The already and the not yet. The already and the not yet. And as followers of Christ, as Christians, we need to remember this. Those of us who are so focused on the end of time, the eschaton, eschatology, Amen. and all our preaching and all our doctrine and all our teaching is about what's going to happen in the future. At the end of days, we need to understand that Jesus did not deny the future reality, but he also emphasized the here and the now. And this is the conversation that he had with the Pharisees who asked him, Jesus, when is the kingdom coming? 
Jesus looked around and he looked at them eye to eye and he said, folks, don't you know, do you not understand? The kingdom of God is among you. It's in your midst. And as Christians, we live in this tension between the not yet and the already, between then and now. And that is the tension that God wants us to live in. Jesus tried to show people that they shouldn't just wait for the kingdom of God. They can experience it now. And I want to ask you today, my brother and my sister, are you experiencing God's kingdom now? Yes, amen. Or are you waiting for that great day? Are you waiting for certain signs and events to take place before you recognize and understand that the kingdom of God is coming? Jesus says to us, as he said to the Pharisees in his day, it's already among you amen. because the kingdom of God amen. doesn't amen. just amen. refer to a realm, a place, but it refers to the reign of God and the reign of God has always been, is present amen. now and will continue to be in the future. And by the way, saints of amen. God, as we teach doctrine, as we do Bible study, it's important for us to keep this in mind. When we talk about the sanctuary doctrine, this isn't the time to get people all uh, worked up about, you know, the, the which, which gold or which silver in the furniture of the Old Dang. Testament tabernacle and temple means X, Y, Z. This isn't the time to indoctrinate people into, well, you have uh, to know this specific piece of the sanctuary the sanctuary doctrine the main point of this was to tell us god with us amen amen let them make me a sanctuary so that i can be in their midst exodus 25 verse 8 god's kingdom now among us in our midst affecting our life dictating my decisions every day in my marriage in my home in my workplace in my health in my Mm. mind in my friendships god's kingdom now among us that's the sanctuary doctrine and when jesus comes on earth he says according to the gospel of john it says the word became flesh took on embodiment and dwelt among us that word means he made sanctuary among us jesus christ didn't sit up there in heaven pontificating, theorizing about what human experience is all about. He didn't sit up there talking about, you know, the philosophy of the human condition. He decided to come down and be like us, to experience life like us, to experience pain and trauma like us. That's the sanctuary doctrine. Amen. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. So the kingdom isn't just the future reality. It's not just the new heavens and the new earth. It's not just the time that people are going to spend gallivanting around the galaxies, but it is God's presence, God's manifestation, God's embodiment among his people now. And this is why when we read the gospels, it tells us things like, the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand, meaning it's within our grasp. It's within our reach. You don't have to go running to search somewhere for it. You don't have to wait for some preacher, some prophet, some elder, some family member to tell you, oh, this is where Jesus is active. That's where Jesus is getting busy. The Bible tells us that the kingdom of God is is within the reach and the grasp of every single person who desires it. And so when Jesus wanted to embody the kingdom of God, when he wanted to explain the kingdom of God, he did what only great teachers do. He did what only the best 
wise people do. He did what the greatest minds and hearts of human history have done. He told a story. He told a story. And Jesus said, if I have to tell you about the kingdom of God and explain it in a way that you can embrace it and understand it. I've got different ways, but today he said to his disciples and to the crowd, I want to tell you what the kingdom of God is like. And I want to show you what the kingdom of God is like. And so Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like yeast. Which yeast? The kingdom of God is like yeast. Which a woman, a woman took and she put it in a bowl of flour. which a woman took and put in a bowl of flour. The kingdom of God is like yeast, which a woman put in a bowl of flour. This is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 33, and also in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, for those of you who would like to follow that in your Bibles. And what this woman did was, as she put the yeast into the bowl of flour, she intended to make dough to make bread. And so she's going to add her water, right? And she's going to give it a good mix. Of course, she's going to follow how her mom taught and use her hands instead of using a spoon, okay? But she's going to mix this all together and she's going to make a dough because the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that you put into flour in order to make dough to bake bread. And the yeast permeates all through that flour until she has a leavened dough that she can then bake. So here's one I made earlier, okay, <laughs> for purposes of time, right? Here's my bowl with my prepared dough, okay? And the same measurement that I've given to you ends up looking like this. And we're gonna come back to this dough again. But as you can see, my yeast here has worked its way all throughout my dough. And this is a nice sticky dough, okay, for some delicious baked goods later on. So I'm going to show you a bit, um, later on now for those of you if you'd like to comment in the chat I want to know who the who the bakers are among us all right so who are the bakers uh, among us and um and both men and women if there are men here as well who uh love baking okay just write that in the chat uh and you know maybe there are people who want to give some tips and and all of that today of uh, secrets of baking but Jesus highlights this woman to his audience to explain that the kingdom of God is like yeast. Now, many of you, many of you may have realized during this pandemic that yeast was more important than some of us previously recognized. In this pandemic, believe it or not, you would go to the grocery store and have a hard time finding yeast. And when you found the yeast, some of the grocery store chains would say two per person or two per household. 
We realized that yeast was a valuable commodity. Someone is shouting out one of the baker ladies here in the chat. Awesome, awesome. And so some of us realized that yeast was more important than we previously recognized. People were at home trying to bake bread and come up with their recipes and do all sorts of things. And even yesterday, and I know you didn't need yeast for that, but even yesterday, many of you practiced making your own communion bread for the communion. And as Jesus is talking about this, he is relating to his audience because they understand, they know what it's like because bread was an everyday staple in their lives for their meals. And many of us as well, this means a lot to us because we have familiar memories of making bread. I have familiar memories, uh, fond memories of my mom making bread um, as a child, as a teenager. And I can, I can always remember the smell, the aroma of that bread in the house. And so this yeast, we recognize was a valuable commodity. And what this ingredient is, is so simple and sometimes seen to be so insignificant. How does a single celled fungi become something that is so much in demand? This particular yeast that is used, that we typically use for baking our bread, literally its name, its Latin name means sugar eating fungus, sugar eating fungus. And the way that it works, the yeast is that it creates the process of fermentation. So this fungi goes into the flour, okay, into the mixture. And what it does is that the fungi eats the sugar present in the ingredients. And it produces its byproducts, carbon dioxide gas and alcohol, helps to then uh, create the fermentation process. And when yeast hits the ingredients, even when there's no added sugar involved, even just the sugar present in the flour starch, right? The maltose, okay, for my, uh, for my um, scientist here, right? It taps into that, feeds on that, and then creates this carbon dioxide and alcohol um, byproducts. And basically that's what we, that's what we smell when we smell bread and, we, and that aroma hits us the gas becomes trapped, okay, in the dough. And what happens then is that it helps the dough to ex expand because the gas gets trapped. Now, in case you think I'm just giving a science lesson here today, I want you to stay tuned because Christ was trying to explain something that may have been more intuitive for his audience than perhaps for some of us today. But we're going to get into this because Jesus compares his kingdom to yeast because he wants his disciples to know that the kingdom of God among you, in your midst, in your lives, in your workplaces, in your health, in your marriages, in your friendships, in your churches, in your communities, should be a leavening agent. It should produce rising realities and expansive experiences. What we also recognize about yeast is that through the carbon dioxide gas that it creates and that it gets trapped in the dough, it actually serves to strengthen the dough, to bring a kind of elasticity to the dough. And so as you can see here from my dough, right, this is before I'm going to sprinkle some more flour on it. So maybe I should, you know, add a little bit of flour here to help me, right, make it not so sticky. You can see here, okay, look at that. Look at that. Look at that stretch here. 
Okay. This is because of the presence of the yeast in the dough. It produces a kind of strength and a kind of elasticity. And today I want to ask the saints of God, today I want to ask you, is God's presence in your life producing strength and elasticity? Are the bonds that we have, like the bonds that are available in the flower that the yeast helps to strengthen, are the bonds in our churches stronger or are they weakening? Are we elastic? Can we be flexible? And I know when we use that word flexibility and elasticity, some of us get really nervous about that because we equate that with, with, with being unorthodox, with breaking the rules, with not following the word of God, um, with, with discarding the tradition of the elders. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're saying is that can the church move and mobilize to meet the needs of the world around them? Amen. For many of us, the pandemic brought a lot of pain. We lost loved ones. Some of us lost our jobs. Some of us had to, 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 to move even. We were forced to make some decisions that we didn't encounter really making. And this past year and a half has been tough. In lockdown, many of us have experienced the kind of tragedies and traumas that we never dreamed about. And yet, there have been opportunities for growth. Uh, we have had perhaps some time to look the person that we love and that we live with in the eye a little more often than we were used to. We have had the opportunity to get connected to technology, to use our virtual capacities to reach out to friends and families across the globe and across the world. The church of God, though, my question is, as we've opened up and we're transitioning, are we going to leave behind the kind of flexibility and the elasticity that we've had to create and develop to going back to the same old, same old? There be any sun and penning for etcher and say, what say I yet? Are we going to, 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 to leave these new opportunities, these opportunities to explore new frontiers, to bring the gospel to people? Are we going to experience and expand that strength and flexibility that we have? Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. As we think about the fermentation process, we recognize that actually, without the yeast activating this, we wouldn't experience that sweet, that delicious fragrance and aroma in our bread. Because what the yeast does is it helps to activate the flavors that are in the other ingredients that we have. Jesus said, when I am present among you, when I'm really part and parcel of your life, you don't have to spend time talking too much. You really don't have to do all that much to indoctrinate people and give them extensive teachings about uh, uh, doctrines and, and philosophies and things like that. Because guess what happens? Whenever you walk by a bakery, whenever you enter into a home <laughs> where there's bread baking, that person who's baking the bread doesn't have to pull you by the collar and say, go to the kitchen, open the oven, look and see that I'm baking bread. 
They don't have to tell you that because the aroma of it hits you. It captures you. It draws you in. And in fact, I learned this, uh, this secret from, from watching a property show, actually, that they said that if you want to increase your chances of selling your home, when people come to visit, they said you can bake some bread, bake some cookies, bake something. Because when people smell the aroma and the fragrance, they're drawn in, they're captured. They feel at home. Somehow that aroma equates to comfort and nourishment and belonging. And the question I have for us today, brothers and sisters, is when people are around you, do they experience that aroma, that fragrance? The Bible describes Jesus as a sweet smelling fragrance. The Bible describes the ministry of Christ as a sweet smelling aroma to God, a sweet smelling fragrance. My question that I have for you today is not your perfume, not the aftershave, the cologne that you use. I'm talking about your life. I'm speaking about your attitude. I'm talking about your conversation. I'm speaking about the way that you interact with people. Do people experience that aroma? Are they drawn in? Do they say, I want to know what makes this person different? I want to understand the ingredients that are mixed up in this person's life that's producing this kind of fragrance and aroma. The bread dough is aerated due to the yeast action. And God's design for all of us is to rise, to expand, to spread aroma, to bring flavor to the world. Because the thing is, here's the thing, saints. God as a baker, he's creative. And he, he has expertise in doing things that some of us have experienced our mothers doing. And, and I don't want to leave out the fathers as well, because some of you experience your father's cooking and, and baking and things like that as well in the home. But some of us experience or can relate to this because of what we experienced in our childhoods, that you had a mother uh, or a father who could take simple ingredients. Hello, somebody could take simple ingredients and make something that was fragrant and aromatic and delicious. And God as a baker even exceeds that because here's the thing. God is making all kinds of bread. As the song says, sugar bread, butter bread, tea bread, all kinds of bread. OK, God is in the business of not making mass products of the same thing. He's not he's not in the factory churning all of us out to look the same way, to taste the same way, to smell even the same way. God is creative and he's making all of us into the unique and the wonderful creations that he wants to make. But the question I have for us is. Are we open to that? Are we open to the fact that today, not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now, but today, God wants to infuse and pervade my life with his presence so that it impacts my home, so that it impacts my extended family, so that it impacts where I walk and work. God as a baker teaches us so much about his kingdom and his purposes. But, you know, Jesus was very wise in that he told people what to look for, but he also gave his disciples and the crowd ideas of counterfeits, ideas of things that were potentially dangerous and even death causing. And so Jesus gives his disciples a caveat. He's sharing this story in chapter 13 of Matthew. In chapter 16 of Matthew's gospel, verse six, it says that Jesus said to them, watch out 
be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He continued, don't you know that I wasn't talking about bread, physical bread, but I'm telling you, be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus was telling them that there was another kind of yeast that they should look for. In fact, in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 15, it says Jesus gave them strict orders. Watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees as well as the yeast of Herod. Jesus contrasts the leaven of heaven to the yeast of religion and empire. There's a kind of yeast that causes more harm than good. There's a kind of yeast that doesn't give off good aroma. There's a kind of yeast that does not create strength and elasticity. It's not infusing ingredients to produce nourishing food. There's a kind of yeast, Jesus says, that comes in religious and secular and political forms and you need to watch out and be on your guard. And today, saints of God, I want us to remember that the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we read about, they were church folk just like us. But what happened is that some of them had begun to substitute ritualism for relationships. And so when we talk about religion here specifically, we're not talking about the true religion that James talks about in his gospel, which is to embody the word of God, right? Not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word also. We are talking about the kind of religion that becomes more about the ritual than about the relationship it actually becomes more about what we can get out of it for our own ends than what actually we are feeding into it. And here's what Jesus says to his disciples after he tells them this story about the woman who is adding the yeast to her flour to bake the dough, to to make the dough and bake this into bread. Jesus says to his disciples, I need you to be on watch for this. I need you to be on guard for this. And I like to think about how Jesus might modernize this if he were living in our day and age today. And I want to think that maybe Jesus would have perhaps given an illustration about yeast infections. Thrush. Watch out for the kind of yeast that overgrows, that dominates, that rather than encouraging health, begins actually to create illness. And in our human bodies, we we recognize that Yeast infections like candida, for example, can grow out of control. And here's something that perhaps some of you who are health workers on the line here already know. But right now, as I'm speaking to you, the Centers of Disease Control have actually set up 10 sites across the United States of America because guess what? Candidemia, which is the candida infection just out of control is actually an emerging public health crisis. And for those of us with with more melanin in the skin, we need to know that actually what they're telling us is that black people for some reasons or for different reasons are twice more likely prone or susceptible to this. And the candidemia is a more serious and a higher level of this candida infection because whereas this yeast infection sometimes uh, grows in the oral cavities, sometimes it's uh, more in the gut area, sometimes uh, it 
experiencing the genital areas and different organs of the body, the heart, the kidneys, even the bones, can edema is when this infection gets into the bloodstream. And then we're not talking just about experiencing the symptoms of itchiness and pain and swelling and, and, and discharge. We're talking about the possibility of death when it hits the bloodstream. And we have people who have been hospitalized extensively due to this candidemia. And so the CDC has said, look, we need to set up population sites. And where we live here in California is one of those sites, one of those states that they've set up to watch this because this thing can easily kill people. You can die from this kind of yeast. Are the saints of God listening this morning, this afternoon? You can die from this kind of yeast. One kind of yeast is bringing together bread so that we can nourish ourselves, so that we can create, you know, this aroma and this fragrance so that we can get this dough and put it in the oven and experience this delicious, life-giving source of nourishment. But one yeast is, is trying to take over the organs and, and when it hits the bloodstream, ultimately, it can be a contributing factor to someone's death. And Jesus says, beware, beware of it. Don't be fooled because mm -hmm. some of you are only looking for Herod's yeast. Some of you are only focused on what's happening in the political arena and, and the laws that are being passed and the different events that are happening with, with, um, within your community or within the nation that you're living in. And Jesus, as he was saying to his disciples, said, yeah, yeah, there's the yeast of Herod. There are the things you're going to experience in the empire, in the great America or the Canada or the United Kingdom, wherever you are watching from today. And there's that. But don't be fooled. Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees, some of them have their own kind of yeast. And today, this is a word for us as Christians. When we begin to substitute our religious experience for ritualism, when we begin to see our faith communities not as the home where God's yeast infuses and pervades all ingredients, all members, all our activities, but we begin to see it as a way for us to promote ourselves, as a way for us to enact our own politics, to go on our own power trips, when we begin to see the faith community and our communities and our homes and our friendships as the way that we push other people down so that we can get a leg up. Jesus says we are being part of the yeast of Herod or the yeast of Pharisees and Sadducees. And Jesus called this out throughout his ministry. And we're familiar with the texts that talk about the Pharisees' hypocrisy, how Jesus called them whitewashed tombs because they look good on the outside, but inside they were full of bones and dead people. We're familiar with when Jesus indicts the Pharisees and the leaders of those days for looking righteous to people, but inside they were full of pretense and rebellion. We're familiar with the fact that Jesus called out that those who were most religious, religious, those who closely identified with the traditions and the teachings of the church were also the very ones who, when the prophets of God showed up, they killed them. Jesus even called them snakes. 
but it wasn't about the name calling. See, Jesus was concerned that when you have this kind of yeast infusing the church, invading the church, invading the home, invading the community, you're not creating life, you're creating death. Jesus was concerned and he addressed them. He said, look, you even do things like you justify people's religious duties and activities when they are hurting the very people they're supposed to love. In Mark chapter seven, verse eight to 13, you can read that in your own time. Jesus confronts some of the church folk because he says, look, you have a church member who is responsible for taking care of his or her parents. They are dependent on him or her. They need that support. They need to, to, to have that love and that time and that support, those resources from this person. And you even justify that person pushing them aside so that that person can support your agenda in the church. And Jesus says, you do a lot of things like that. You let people leave their responsibilities, leave the love that they are supposed to give all in the name of religion's practice. And it's wrong. And how many times in our churches have we lauded leaders and elders and, and Sabbath school teachers and youth leaders who neglect their families? Some who have abused their children, abused other people in the community, and we praise them, we laud them, we encourage them because she can preach, she can teach, she can do this. Jesus says, beware of that kind of yeast because it creates death, not life. And so maybe today you're wondering, you're wondering, how do I know in my life whether what's pervading my life is the presence of God, the purpose of God, the will of God, the intention of God, or is it the world? Is it the empire? Is it the so-called religious ritualism? How do I know? Jesus says it's simple. It's simple. The proof is in the pudding. Or in this case, the proof is in the loaf. Are you rising? Are you creating that aroma? Are you contributing that strength? Is your presence in that friendship circle, are you strengthening people's bonds or are you that person that always goes one person to the other and creates conflict? Are you that person that strengthens the bonds by being able to tell the truth even when you have to speak it in love to those in power? Or do you just sit there and watch the destruction taking place? Jesus said the proof is in the pudding and that rising, that flexibility, the texture of the dough, the aroma, all of that is going to let you know that I'm pervading my life, your community with my presence. And I know she wasn't talking about dough here because I've read this poem so many times, but Professor Angelou wrote a poem, Still I Rise. And one of the reasons that I think Jesus used the yeast was because he understood that many of us are facing challenges and predicaments where everything is testing our lives. And it was to this that Dr. Angelou wrote the following words, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air I'll rise. 
Out of the hearts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Dr. Angelou, you see, wasn't necessarily talking about yeast, but she was talking about this existential rising that I believe Jesus wanted for each and every one of his followers. You see, many of us have endured pain and trauma, challenges. Many of us are reaching out to a world where people are asking themselves, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose of all of this? We work with people like that. We love people like that. We may even live with people like that. And God is trying to tell us that the proof is in the pudding. People don't need necessarily more sermons. Ellen White says that when Jesus Christ came here on earth, he did more healing than he did preaching. That's what she says. Jesus Christ healed people, touched people, reached out to them, embraced them more than he did give sermons on the, on the mount. Have you noticed how many sermons on the mount there are? Have you realized that Jesus connected with people through their stories and their life experiences? We need to understand as a church that it is not the preacher's who are preaching the sermons. It is not the Bible study teachers who are teaching the Bible. It is not really all about that, but it's about each one of us embodying the kingdom, the presence of God in the here and the now. That is what's going to attract people. That is what's going to draw people in. And listen to the preacher this morning, who is a theologian who teaches theology, who gets excited about reading all these deep and, 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 and um, dense works. And I have nothing against that. But what I'm saying to us today as the church of God is that we have overdone things. Amen. We yes. have begun to be so immersed in ritual and in certain practices that we have lost the heart of it. And many of us, it's more important for us to show up for the program than it is to embody the presence of God. Let me say that again. For many of us, it is more important for us to show up for the program than it is to be made available to the presence of God. Yes, Prisha. And God is saying the proof that people need to see is in the loaf. It's in the bread. It's in the yeast. Raising and strengthening and bringing elasticity. And the thing is, sometimes I have to knead you. Sometimes I have to mold you. Sometimes it feels like I'm kind of pushing you about. Sometimes it feels more like a manipulation than a massage. Right? Sometimes I have to get you into my hands and, and do this. Okay? And work you and mold you and knead you. Sometimes I have to do that so that you understand that this is your purpose. This is your purpose to expand, to give off aroma, to be that person that I want you to be. Today, the church of God willing, are the brothers and sisters here on the platform willing? Or is Jesus's message not deep enough for you? Is it not spiritual enough for you? Is it not orthodox enough for you? Is it not complicated enough for you? Brothers and sisters, Jesus lifts up this woman who is 
getting ready to bake her bread because that's the appeal and the invitation that God has for each and every single one of us. As he's in our presence, he says, would you let me infuse your life with my yeast? Would you allow me to give you this agent Yeah, baby. 
Thanks, oh God. I want you to know that this interruption is an indication of just how important this message is today. Man. As I'm preaching to you, can you Man. imagine doom saw? <laughs> Doom saw took place. The whole house, the electricity just cut. I'm here to tell you it's not by accident. We prayed about this day. We prayed about this message because God is looking for us as we're transitioning back, as we're opening up, as we're making decisions even now about our personal and collective commitments to Christ. Amen. It's not an accident that in the midst of me giving this appeal, everything just went off. But here's the thing that the enemy doesn't know. That there's no power cut. There's no situation in life. There's no trauma or pain. There's no tragedy. Like Professor Angelou said, there's no, there's no slavery. There's no enmity. There's nothing that the devil or the folk who are working for him can do to stop this message going forward that Jesus is saying, I'm not just showing up in the future somewhere. I'm not just the property of some folk in particular communities or positions. I'm available to you right now. Amen. Amen. My kingdom Amen. can be manifest, manifest in your life right now. And so I want those of you who are on the platform today, this is not about who's watching. Um, you don't even have to turn your video on necessarily. But I just want you where you are in the house. Perhaps you are sitting with a wife or a husband. Perhaps you're with your children. Maybe you are by yourself in the place where you are listening or watching this, wherever you are, I just want you to make that commitment. God, I'm open. I'm available. I'm ready. For those of you who are contemplating baptism, I urge you, I urge you, as John the Baptist urged people, this is your opportunity to commit yourself to Christ. Don't pass it up. Don't let it escape you. Don't go by without exploring that opportunity to be baptized into a community of faith where you are. And for those of us who have already made that commitment today, God is saying, are you willing? Are you willing to let me infuse your life in practical, concrete ways so that you can be a nourishment, so that you can give life, not death, so that you are not embodying the yeast of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herods, but that you are my chosen uh, person. You are that, that person that's going to, to add to the beauty of the community, the strength of the community, the resilience of the community. And today, if you want to make that commitment with me, I'm just going to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to either in the chat or by raising your hand on the platform just to make that indication to God. Again, it's not about the preacher. It's not about what anyone on this platform is going to see. It's about you and me making that commitment to God. And as you do that, I'm just going to invite you to join me in prayer. Today, God, I'm so thankful for you. I thank you that your word is life, that your word is wisdom for us as we navigate the decisions that we need to make each and every day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to love people, to lift them up, to infuse hope and goodness. I thank you that you are calling us 
if we have been used as agents of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herods, I thank you that even now you are giving us that opportunity to change our hearts and to change our lives, to do a U-turn and to recognize that that's not really going to take us anywhere. It's ultimately only going to bring death Mm -hmm. to those who are around us and eventually to us ourselves. Today, God, I ask that we would be the yeast that our spouses are longing to experience. We would be the yeast that our children need to see modeled in front of them. I ask that we would be the yeast, the dough that you put into church communities so that we can bring life and love and and truth and goodness. I thank you that you are giving us opportunities to not just be workers and professionals who clock in and clock out, who go in and do what we need to do and get out again. But I ask that where we work, whatever it is that we do, we can make a difference where we are in the places where you have planted us. Today I'm asking, especially, I want to hold in front of you those who are on the line today who have been hurt, who have been injured, God, because leaders, we have used our positions and our platforms and our voices and our opportunities. Rather than creating life, we have brought sickness and death. Father, I ask that this church hurt and the pain and the trauma that people are experiencing, not just in churches, but in their lives, in their marriages, in their workplaces, wherever it may be, God, I ask that you would use this opportunity to begin healing, Lord. Take us and heal us, just like you have been doing, just like we've prayed for this week, Lord. Continue to heal our homes, continue to heal our children, continue to heal our marriages, continue to heal our connections, heal our communities, Lord. Help us to get our priorities right, to align them with your purposes instead of other things that we are often drawn to. Today, God, we make a commitment to you that no matter how much you have to need us, no matter how much you have to shape us, no matter how hot the oven feels at times, we are in your hands. We want you to infuse our lives, pervade our existences with your presence. Let us be the dough in your hand that truly brings forth an aroma that will attract others. As we lift you up, let all people, especially the ones to whom we are connected, be drawn to you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you, my dear. Amen. 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 We thank our brothers and sisters for that wonderful music. And now let us receive the benediction, which simply means blessing. And as we receive the blessing, let us also um, imagine that we are this dough in the hands of our maker. God, may we be the loaves in your hand. May we be the nourishment that this world needs as you need us and shape us and process us even in the very ovens of our lives. Let us have this trust and confidence in you, that you who has begun a good work in us 
will indeed bring it to completion. As we are made and processed by you, allow us to be the aroma, the fragrance and the sustenance in our homes, in our workplaces, in our faith communities, wherever we find ourselves, may people experience us and in so doing experience you. As you infuse and pervade our lives, may we pattern after you who is the true bread of life. And the church of God said, Amen. 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 Amen.